Yeah, there is a question in the chat I see right now, which I'll jump on right away here, and then we can go to the other. Um, so the coal and gas and hydrocarbon based, you know, power grid that we have right now, you know, the city's not in control that SAS power is, but that's not to say that we're sitting back and just saying, do what you're going to do SAS power. I meet with SAS power um, actually every two weeks, we discuss options and opportunities moving forward. Um, what's really going to push that is the federal government's requirements on utilities. And there's a lot of talk that the federal government is going to push their net zero requirements of utilities to 2035 and not even 2050. So, you know, actions like that go a long way to push power utilities into changing how they do business. Um, we're in active talks about how the city can potentially be partnering with, with them uh, on, you know, solar farms, wind farms, other sources, renewable, uh, natural gas uh, to energy type solutions. So, um, it's been modeled out to 2035 with SAS Power's current projections. And that is part of that actual gap. It, it wasn't just industry. It's actually SAS Power as part of that gap in there as well, where we can't quite get to net zero. But um, talking with them, they're working hard to get to that point and they need to from a regulatory perspective. So that's really where, where we need to rely on the federal government and, you know, SAS Power following, you know, federal regulation to, to meet those goals. I'd also just add to that very first question about coal-based electrical supply is that coal will be phased out, I'm pretty sure, by 2035. Like I, the federal government created it. There yeah. won't be any more coal-powered electricity. So, I mean, that's one of the things. So our plan, let's say, doesn't like... We, ad we address kind of like known realities in that sense, but I mean, we're not saying that we can make the utilities stop doing something or we can't make SASC power be more clean we can you know encourage them or we can show a willingness to partner with them on projects or we could try to show them that there's a demand for renewable products but um there's also a lot of legislative um you know like we're not able to to be a power provider we can't be a power company that's all regulated from the provincial government so again it's really also looking at what is really within our control that doesn't mean kind of these grandiose changes like well we just need to create our own power company but that, that's not actually possible so knowing that we're not allowed to do that um what can we do um Joe, oh, did you want to how did you want to go about questions here Let's yeah what's the so I will add a spotlight. So I can read the questions and then you can answer them. Sure. Uh, so I'll just mention that uh, Bob Halliday commented that actually the supply is now gas-based. Um, we have a question that is, uh, it starts with a comment. I congratulate the city of Regina for making a commitment to having net zero emissions by 2050, but almost 10% of the time between then and uh, 2050 has already passed. Since it is easiest to address low hanging fruit in the early years, has there been any reduction in energy use approaching 10% or more so far? If not, what makes you optimistic that net zero or even having of current energy usage can actually be achieved? So I can answer that not so much from a community perspective right now, because we don't have, you know, numbers year over year on that, but from a city of Regina and, and uh, corporate perspective, we saw a significant reduction from 2019 to, tw wait, 2019, 2020. Yeah, 2019 to 2020 in our greenhouse gas emissions as an organization uh, in our operations areas. This is largely due, actually, I, I, we did a bit of analysis on it. it's mostly due to um, reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions from SAS power. Um, every year we get a number on what their, you know, their greenhouse gas emissions are per megawatt hour, kilowatt hour. Um, and it, it actually was reduced year over year from SAS Power because they've greened up the grid quite a bit. And it was a favorable year for things like hydro, wind and solar generation that they do currently have in their systems. So we, we did see a reduction and, you know, in, in our operating areas, it was around 12 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, as a corporation, we didn't do as well because our landfill gas to energy was being retrofitted and we had to shut the system down to install 
an expanded landfill gas to enter, or a landfill gas collection system, which is now back up and running. Um, when that's up and running, you know, that has the potential of taking the city of Regina's corporate emissions down an additional, I believe, 20 percent. So we're making big strides corporately. And um, there's a lot of technology out there that it's been there. It's not new stuff. We just need to really work on how we can implement it into, you know, planning development. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I think like the, if I could just like I, I, yeah, I get the, the sense of the question is really just though that like, I mean, we even talked about the city of Regina itself is a very small percentage of the overall emissions. So, I mean, if the, the question is fair, um, I, I would just add though, the plan for us, even though we did the modeling starting in 2016, the plan doesn't actually start until 2022. So we use modeling to help kind of create that yes. scenario. So the plan starts 2022 to 2050. So really it's a 30, let's say 30 year plan, 28 year plan. So, I mean, that doesn't help us out any, it, it actually compacts the amount in a smaller time frame, so I just I guess would say that like we actually we haven't lost you know that notion of ten percent of time hasn't actually passed because we, the plan hasn't actually started the plan hasn't been approved the whole process that we've described is is creating the plan of saying starting this year what do we have to do from twenty twenty two until twenty fifty to 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 get to where we want to go and so maybe I didn't clarify that as much as I could have at the at the beginning that yeah we started our modeling as 2016 is the baseline year, but the actual framework that we're developing talks about starting in 2022 to 2050. So we haven't lost any, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there'll be hiccups, but we haven't really lost any ground because the plan hasn't actually started yet. Okay. Next question comes from James Wood. What kind of support is coming from the province at this time? So that is, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a cop-out question and then I'll answer a bit more with it though. But that is really something you would need to ask the provincial government what they're planning on putting forward. Um, there has been some discussions on shifting some funding towards, you know, to, to I don't want to say they're going to fund, match funding or, or match grants or anything like that, but to shift their funding to match the same projects that the federal government is funding, but that's really preliminary stuff. Um, but that was something you'd really need to ask the province at this time. Uh, from Bob Halliday, are you considering urban design, for instance, reducing urban sprawl? Yeah. So part of the part of one of the it, it wasn't captured in the big seven moves, but it's another item that the city really needs to look at, and that's densification of residential and commercial development. Um, densification of the downtown core is key. You know, we've seen hollowing out of, of city cores uh, that's, you know, been exasperated with COVID and, and working from home. But we need to really focus on how we can get people back into the downtown core, but then also densify along, you know, transit corridors and transit nodes. Um, and also things like, you know, considering uh, complete communities so that we can have more active transportation, like cycling, walking and whatnot, but also just to make that transit um, that much more attractive for people to take. So that's definitely something that it's it's addressed in the plan, but we're really gonna have to look hard at, you know, what the best practices are for that. It's, it's something that most Canadian cities are really struggling with right now. So um, it, it's something that we need to take a good hard look at. Uh, Mike asks, how do you plan to stay strong and face the expected resistance of oil lobbyists? So, you know, that's not so much a question for administration as it is for, you know, others. But um, we have sat down with uh, Federated Co-op and, you know, they do have or they're, they're in the development of a uh, net zero plan for 2050. And, you know, they said that we can we can say like they do support the city's goals of net zero by 2050. So, you know, I think that goes a long way when when an oil refinery or, you know, uh, a company whose largest profit center is an oil refinery will say they do support the city's goals. Um, you know, I, I think. Go ahead, I was just, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say it is important. I think like recognizing what our role in this all is as like public servants, like we answer, like we're employed, you know, as like, as people that work for the city, we have like literally no say in, in like, we don't are not the ones that are talking to oil lobbyists or, or the ones. So we, I mean, it's also trying to be very neutral and objective public servants. So, um, in the same way, like, unfortunately, depending on what your perspective is, 
we have to stay strong in the face of environmental lobbyists as well, right? Like, um, and I think that becomes challenging for a lot of people because people are very passionate. I mean, I'm personally passionate about this work too, but it's also maintaining a, a sense of objectivity that there's, as I mentioned, there's people that are very um, passionate from like an environmental perspective that want to see this even more aggressive or think we're not going fast enough or that, um, you know, we are already in the pocket of oil and gas or we're already been bought, you know, and our, our framework's already been like soiled by, by oil. So, I mean, it goes both ways. And I mean, I, I can imagine the people that are on this call are uh, which side of, of that kind of, uh, of team they're on. I, I would, I, I think I could assume that, but yeah, I mean, it, we, we have to stay strong in the face of any sort of kind of influence, generally speaking as public servants. Yeah. And as public servants, it's not real, like you said, it's not really our position to, you know, advocate um, for oil and gas or for the environment. It's to build the plan that we were asked to bring forward uh, by council. And then they will ultimately make the decision on that. Yep. Democracy. Next question is, could heat pumps be used for household heating and air conditioning in Regina's climate? Absolutely. Um, you're going to see a lot about heat pumps. Now, there's going to be some detractors against heat pumps uh, that, you know, you know, it gets minus 40 here and heat pumps don't work. And we're well aware of that. Like, I'm an engineer by training. I understand there's limitations to these things, but I also understand there's backup systems and other technologies we can put in place. Um, if 90% of the year we can run highly efficient uh, heat pumps or use, you know, district geothermal or whatever's right for that circumstance, um, you know, to, to focus on the five to 10% of the outliers is, is not usually a efficient use of our time and resources. We need to account for it, but not dwell on it and focus on it. We need to just build in backup systems and whatnot. So you'll see a lot on heat pumps. Yeah. So generally there's really, I mean, no other way that I know of for heating with electricity, right? I mean, I guess, or the most, sorry, the most efficient way would be for using heat pumps. Um, again, if, if we want to talk about oil and gas lobbyists, I mean, if you really look at the, how the messaging evolves around heat pumps, it, it usually depends on, on who's putting out the message and heat pump technology has definitely improved over the last decade or more. And so from my understanding, you heat pumps work, I think, you know, the technology now has heat pumps working up to minus 20. And so then, as Greg mentioned, you'll usually have uh, uh, some sort of backup to uh, make sure you can get that heating when those, those heating days are, are below minus 20. So again, it's, we're obviously in a unique situation, no different than Saskatoon, where we have really cold climates. But interestingly, if you actually look at the, the data, the amount of days that are over minus 20, I mean, it's minus 30 right now. So it, feels like I'm lying to everyone, but it, it's not, it's not as much as people. I think we, we kind of oversell how cold it gets for how long it gets here. The next question is for Mike. Does the plan have ways to accelerate if we fall behind our goals? So we're not um, building contingencies into the action plans yet. We do have, um, you know, a schedule built of when we need to achieve these by. That'll be something that as we measure and as we um, report, we'll need to look at if we do start falling behind, how to accelerate those goals or how to, you know, make up that lost ground. But um, we can't go into it building the contingency plans, assuming we're going to fall behind and fail right off the bat. So um, it's some, it's a dynamic plan, like I said, and we're just going to have to make sure we monitor and adjust as we go on. We need to pivot where needed. I think another piece to that is it's, it's from kind of having a, looking at these plans from across Canada, it's, it's important to just kind of, from a really big picture perspective, essentially all these big moves are very consistent across Canada. I mean, obviously depending on climate, the, the heat, the heat pump thing is, is obviously unique or the need to address certain kind of how the grid performs. Like our grid is dirtier than let's say Vancouver, than British Columbia's grid. So there's some of those nuances, but all homes have to become more energy efficient. All buildings have to become more energy efficient. People's vehicles have to stop burning fossil fuel. People um, need to walk more, bike more, take the bus more. You know, all these things are, are essentially 
fairly standard. There's nothing like revolutionary in our plan versus Saskatoon's plan. If you look at them, they're very, very similar. Um, most cities, again, it, it'll be different. Vancouver, let's say, is already 98%. Their electricity is already 98% renewable because they have hydropower. So there's some of these kind of nuances, but really the, the, the big broad strokes are very similar. So in terms of contingencies, they just have to be done. And then really the contingency is every that compounding effect of, of emissions that go into the atmosphere. It just means you have to do that much more the next year. So if you don't, if you don't retrofit all the houses by 2030, well, you still have to re retrofit all the houses by 2031. So really it's just all the work has to still happen. It just means you have to do it in a compacted amount of time. So the contingency is just, we don't have the numbers all built out, but really it's all that stuff still has to get done whether it happens in the time it still has to get done. And it's just the best return on our investment, the best community outcomes are if we follow that trajectory that we've laid out um, according to the way we've run the numbers. So it's really just anything that deviates from that. You don't get the same financial payoffs. You don't see the same return on your investment. You don't see the same emissions reductions. The next question is from Gail. Thank you for a hopeful and detailed look at the update since the forum last October. Is the refinery considering changes like those Scottford and Dow are implementing in Fort Saskatchewan? Are you considering creating space for an investment group to be a leading entity to carry out, carry the upfront costs of retrofits? So on the refinery part, that's something we are going to have to engage more with the refinery. They are working on their net zero plan moving forward. And we haven't seen a lot of detail on what that actually looks like yet at this point, but it is something that we plan on engaging further with the refinery on. As for creating investment space, you know, we're looking at a lot of different options for um, retrofit and, and financing of that, whether that be grant programs. Um, the federal government has some grant programs right now we're looking at, is that something we could uh, work with and, and match or something like that? We're also looking at potentially pay style loans, whether the city be the lender or whether we could talk with another group who potentially could come in and be the lender on something like that. Um, all the details of that haven't been worked out yet, but those are definitely some of the, um, you know, um, bigger ideas or, or kind of middle level ideas that we're looking at without all the details worked out. Um, Ryan's been working with this a lot. Maybe he can answer that second part a little more succinctly. Uh, I don't know about succinctly, Greg, you're, you're always, you're always the most succinct. Um, yeah. I mean, it'll be, it'll be interesting, obviously Saskatoon, or if people are aware on this call, Saskatoon has um, a PACE program, they call it HELP, um, Home Energy Loan Program. Um, they, one of the, the parts that I didn't mention is that there is funding available through the Federation of Canadian Mun Municipalities, FCM. So there is kind of funding that you can access for some of these programs. I mean, there's definitely pros and cons to all of them. Um, there's no silver bullet. And I think uh, some of these things as it become like kind of, I'd say trendy, especially in Canada, because they've been available in other, in, in, in America for, for longer, but they all, they all sound really great, but uh, the devil's in the details and um, trying to find, I, I think, trying to balance um, reaching the most amount of people or achieving the, the best use of that money or, or being the most equitable with that money. It's really challenging. Usually you can't just have one program, like a PACE program um, has a lot of uh, equity uh, considerations that, that I think aren't addressed very well. Like you, you're not still hitting the people that really could use the help the most. So there's a lot of, I think, nuance and it's really, it is something that really doesn't have a great one size fits all solution to. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if Saskatoon has, has uh, a similar organization, but for example, Regina has a solar cooperative. So you can be a part of this cooperative and for a nominal fee, you can you become a member and you could, your house, you join and you can get, be part of bulk buys where a whole bunch of houses, homeowners buy solar panels at a cheaper rate. And then they go in together for, uh, they'll go to a contractor and say, you know, if you renovate all 10 houses, can we get a better contracting rate? So there's, I think there's kind of like those interesting gaps where the community finds ways to fill those gaps that the city can't always fill or like lending institutions aren't always going to fill. So um, we're definitely always 
I think like exploring what opportunities there are. And like Greg said, I'm, I'm looking at some of those finance things. I mean, it would be great if we have a really strong history of, of credit unions, uh, cooperatives in, you know, in Saskatchewan, it'd be great if, if our, if our banks kind of stepped up for some of those lending banks are really good at lending money. They do it for a living. So it's also trying to find the best, you know, the city isn't traditionally a lending institution. So lending money is like, a new line of business. So if we could get banks lending money, that would be great. You know, so if you're anybody. Yeah. And I think that goes to the partnerships and stuff that we really do need to explore moving forward. And um, like Ryan brought up a really important part that we, I don't think we touched on nearly enough in the presentation went on is um, the equity component of this. And we really see that, you know, a lot of programs that have been introduced in the past, um, you know, they don't really work for, you know, the marginalized communities that we have. And they they really give an advantage to those with money. Uh, those who can afford to do it can knock money off their power bill. Those who can afford to do it can, you know, reduce energy costs. Well, what about those without? And how do we, how do we make this a, a benefit to them? Because if they can have reduced energy costs and, and things like that, like that's a real advantage uh, to them in the long run, because it reduces the cost of them, you know, just living. So um, there's those components. And then also the just transition piece of it, we never really touched on. And how do we ensure that, you know, people who are currently working in some industries can transition into new industries, but how do we, how do we create an environment for, again, underrepresented groups to become trained and work in these areas and, you know, build that prosperity in those areas and, you know, build that capacity. So those are, those are other things that we, we mentioned in the framework. We don't get into a bunch of detail because like Ryan said, the devil's in the detail and for each action, it's a little bit different how we do it and how we need to consider it. And, you know, we'll need to go forward really considering how we implement, but also how we recommend for implementation to council moving forward with these things. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Bob Halliday. Uh, some things will happen no matter what Regina does, such as EVs. Others require direct action by the city, such as net zero ready housing in, build in the building code. Can you discuss how many of the required actions are controllable by the city? Yeah, so I mean, building codes are sort of controllable by the city. We adopt building codes. Um, the federal government's coming out with the net zero ready building codes, and there's some step codes for residential and commercial coming into place that will move uh, new construction to net zero. Um, all indications are, you know, I've heard anyways, I don't know how official it is that the province will be adopting those, those, uh, there may be some tweaks, you know, for, th there's always some changes uh, jurisdictionally, just because they're, they're generally focused in Eastern Canada and some things just don't generally apply here very well, usually around things like foundations and stuff like that. But uh, the province would adopt and then the city would likely adopt and then we could potentially, you know, add some development standards on top of that on things around like ele uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure if it's not strong enough in our opinion um, in the building code. So that's something that, you know, it, it's one of the easier ones actually because it's going to really be moved, like 90% of it's going to get moved through the building codes as they start rolling across from the federal government. Yeah, I think, yeah, generally speaking, in terms of actions that are controllable by the city, I mean, the city doesn't have very much authority on most of these things to be, you know, in like, if we're actually looking at jurisdiction, power comes from the utility, there's legislation in place that dictates who can create power, sell power, distribute power, natural gas how we heat our homes. That's all provincially regulated again from the crown corporations. Um, the building code, there's a national building code, like Greg mentioned, uh, provinces adopt the national building code. They could create their own building code if they want, but most just out of convenience adopt the national building code. So we're, you know, fortunately the, the, the federal government has said they're going to, you know, push for a net zero building code by 20, would you say 30. 2030? Yeah. 2030. So again, we would, likely just a, 
Saskatchewan would just adopt the national building code. So the actual effort for Regina or any city to go ahead and create its own building code, it would be pretty, you know, it would be a multi-year process in itself. So, I mean, it's really trying to find the balance of, of, you know, do we just like our model, for example, just accounts for the changes to the national building code and assumes adoption by the province, because that's kind of historically what's been the case. There's no real reason to assume that they wouldn't like they would have to be starting planning for that already because the, the building code gets updated every couple of years. And so they have planned up planned improvements and changes over the years. So really, except if there's any extenuating circumstances, we would just be following the building code. Um, we can add incentives. We can try to encourage people through other mechanisms. Like Greg mentioned, we could say, well, we kind of wish there was EV charging in development. So how could we find ways to, to, to encourage more developers to put more EV charging? Or how could we encourage developments to happen a certain way? But in terms of, of actual control, I mean, frankly, there isn't, I mean, a lot of authority and what we can dictate people do. We don't, can't tell businesses how to operate. We don't have a, a, a business kind of tax or a business license. Um, yeah. If I know, I don't know. That's, that's what... yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to see that the federal government's moving in this direction because it really does make it a lot easier for us because they are the regulatory um, oversight for a lot of these things. So, you know, it's, as municipality, we're tasked with a lot of things, but we don't have a control over a lot of things. So um, having that, that senior level level of government moving in the same direction is definitely helpful. Uh, we are coming to the end of our time, but uh, there is one more question from Carol. Uh, and if any of you do have to go, uh, Katya has put in information about the next sustainable speaker series session, which will be on March 22nd in the chat. Uh, anyway, Carol's question is, can you describe the plan for how electric charging stations will be introduced? I wish I could at this moment, actually. It's one of these things that's really on my mind because we, like, I, I say to everyone in the city, it's like, if this plan doesn't happen, EVs are happening. Like, we need to really start thinking about that as a city. Um, so what we're looking at is, so there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of levers involved with EVs and we've just started looking at them, uh, you know, market choice and, and the push to electric vehicles by the, uh, federal government, it's really going to have a move on industry, you know, like similar to gas stations, we'll see electric vehicle charging stations popping up from a commercial perspective, the, the bigger I think challenge that we're going to look at or that we're going to see is um, existing building stock. Building codes will talk about electric charging and electrical requirements for, for new builds, but existing stock, if you look at any apartment building is, is the example I usually go to in the city of Regina, they do not have electric charging infrastructure in place. They do not have the required uh, electrical servicing even to charge that many electric vehicles. So how do we incentivize, require, um, you know, whatever it is to make that happen? Maybe it's something that happens again because of the market, because nobody will want to rent an apartment without an electric vehicle charging station attached to it. So, you know, I, I think the first step is education and and maybe a bit of that advocacy even to you know rental companies and even homeowners within the city that this is coming you need to start thinking about this it's not going to be a cheap touch so let's start talking about how we can do this and how the city can help or at least you know facilitate that moving forward so yeah it's it's going to be um it's going to be interesting how that unfolds in that area but you know that is definitely an area where the city has a role to play um in in making this happen it's also an interesting kind of balance in trying to you know the part of that plan is about ev electric vehicles and then you know increasing the amount of vehicles but also like charging infrastructure but also the plan is really focused on trying to in increase um transit ridership uh, active transportation walking biking etc so it's also trying to balance how much effort you put in increasing 
charging infrastructure when you could be trying to increase the amount of people that maybe don't need to drive their vehicle at all. And so it's, I think, also a balancing act um, that will be ongoing is, you know, do we want to try to shift, does, should the community shift towards less kind of private vehicle ownership? And then you wouldn't need as much charging infrastructure because there's less vehicles. So, uh, I mean, yeah, definitely a lot of moving parts that we have to constantly be, you know, thinking about. Uh, that is the end of the questions. I'm going to uh, uh, give things over to Katya to finish up. Um, and I will, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention uh, that our uh, next uh, sustainability speaker here will be on uh, March 22nd. And um, the title would be on a collision course, birds and humans. It will be presented by uh, Jan Shedik from Wildlife, uh, sorry, Wildlife Rehabilitator at the Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the uh, perils facing our birds in the city. So hope to see a lot of people there. And thanks uh, very much, uh, Dred and Ryan, for such an interesting and informative presentation. Thanks for having us. Yeah, if anybody wants any more information, go to that website Ryan put up. It's all there, and it'll tell you what's coming up next for 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 all that stuff. I'm sure Greg's phone number and email is there too. So, <laughs> okay, thanks. Have a good one.